is our refuge and strength. Refuge and strength, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Ever present help in trouble. Ever present help in trouble. Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you have decided to join us today on this Greenwood Park Church of Christ online cast of June the 28th, 2020. My name is Tim Pence and I'm one of the nine shepherds here at Greenwood Park. We want to let you know that there are several links on the Facebook and YouTube pages that will be down below the video description that's on your screen there. And these we think that you might find very informative. There's one particular link that is, will direct you to the online connection card that you can fill out for any prayer request you may have and, and these will be directed to the elders and ministers per your request. We also want to let you know that these cards are available for our visitors as well, so please fill one out. If you have any questions on what our church is about, how to become a Christian, or, or maybe you're dealing with discouragement, then please let us know and we can pray and or talk with you. We believe in the power of God and we know that there is true healing and power through prayer. We also offer many different ways to give during this season. We are continually amazed at your consistent generosity and so appreciative for your generous hearts. It, it could be very tempting to stop giving during this time, but you have continued on and we thank God and for you for this blessing. As many of you know, this past several days has been especially difficult for our church family. Our hearts go out to Ruth Hudson and her family in the, lo in the loss of our beloved brother and friend, Larson Hudson. Larson was a great example of a man of faith and love for our God. His humbleness and love for the Lord were shown not only in words, but in his deeds. He and Ruth were usually one of the first ones to step up and give to whatever cause that we had going on, whether it be for individuals or for the church in general. He will be greatly missed, and we know that he has fought the good fight, he has run the race, he has kept the faith for the crown of righteousness that is, that is laid up for him. Ruth, we love you, and we will continue to hold you and the family up in prayers during this difficult time. And I just also want to let you know that there will be a visitation, a drive-through visitation at Cone Funeral Home for uh, Larson tonight between the hours of 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. if you would like to stop by and offer your condolences to the family. A private burial service will be held on Monday. We're also saddened to announce the father of Amanda Brown and her brother Evan Brown passed away unexpectedly this past week as well. We want to continue to hold them up in prayer before, before God. Shifting gears now, I want to share some exciting news from the elders. As most of you know, it's been since March the 8th since we have last met together here at the building. The good news is, is that we have decided to start meeting together with in-house worship on Sunday, June, July the 12th, which is just two weeks from today. We know that many, are, many of you are excited about this and are ready to go. However, it will not be as you have known it previously to be. Many new things will be in place to ensure the maximum amount of protection and distancing of our members. As we stated a couple of weeks ago, the elders know that there are many differing opinions in our own church family as to the situation we are living in. It ranges from those who think that this virus and the associated rules are a bunch of nonsense, it's overrated, to those who are extremely terrified of contracting the virus and are afraid of everyone who that is around them. We respect everyone's opinion, and because of that, all of us who are in Christ need to extend grace to our brothers and sisters who may see things differently than from our own viewpoint. To our older members, 
We know that you want to return, and, but you do not feel comfortable in doing so. The elders want to assure, assure you that it is 100% okay if you decide to stay home, especially those who have underlying health conditions. This also applies to anyone else and to those families who have young children. Our online services will continue to be available, available to you as in the past. Let your conscience be your guide. If you're older and decide to come, you, you will be welcomed. But just you need to be aware of the potential risk you are taking if you decide to do so. There have been many teams comprised of our deacons, ministers, and members who have come up with plans in addressing how returning is going to look and be carried out. We just ask that you give them your full cooperation. Is it going to be awkward? Yes. Is it going to be uncomfortable? Yes. However, we think that in time, we will all get used to these procedures. This next st statement that I would like to make may sound rather harsh, but I don't know of any other way how to convey the elder's policy on, return on returning back to the building. That statement is, is that everyone who attends must follow the rules and procedures we have put in place to ensure everyone's safety. Now let me give you some examples and details of the things you may expect on returning. We will be offering two services every week. The first one will be at 9 a.m. and this is the one we, re we refer to as the fully masked service. That service is that you will be expected to wear your mask upon entering the parking lot, on entering the building, while you're at your seat during the entire service and upon exiting, exiting the building. Now our second service will begin at 11 a.m. You, you will be required to wear a mask to and from the building as, as was stated previously. However, you will have the option to remove that mask once you are seated in the sanctuary. We ask that you remain at your seat at all times after you have been ushered to it. If you forget to bring your mask, one will be provided. And let me also add that no nursery or no classes will be offered at this time. Another important change is that you will be required to register online or you have the option of calling the church office for the service that you and your family choose to attend. This registration method is one that we have, have observed from other churches who have used it in planning their return and it seems to work very well. This registration form will be posted on the church website which is greenwoodparkchurch.com beginning on July the 6th. This information will be used by the different teams to determine how many will be attending each service and how they will need to plan accordingly. You will have to fill out this form for every week that you plan on attending. There will be a cutoff for signing up for a service on Fridays at 12 noon for each week. It's simple and will only take you a minute or so to fill out. Now, if you're not able to fill out the online form, we ask that you call the church office at 270-781-78, or excuse me, 781-0700 for assistance in registering. But please be reminded you, you will need to do that every week as well. Because of social distancing guidelines and the state mandates we must follow to meet together, we are limited to the number of family units allowed at the sanctuary at every service. We realize this may cause some inconvenience, but feel it is necessary to protect our members and it will accommodate the majority of our members. We will also make provisions for visitors who show up. In order for you to get a sense of how return will look, there will be videos posted on Facebook and YouTube showing the many changes and what you will be experiencing on returning. For example, which specific doors that you will be allowed to enter and exit the building, uh, communion and offering instructions, and also being ushered to and from your seat. You will be given hand sanitizers, you will have your temperature checked, and you will be ushered 
to your seat, which more than likely will not be the one that you have sat in for the last 10 to 40 years. So we just please ask that you give our greeters and ushers your full cooperation. Our cleaning crew will be there to clean between services and after the last service. These videos will be funny and entertaining, but they will get across the information that you will need to know. And also the emails and one calls will continue to be made. I'm sure that there may be some hiccups in how we things go at the very beginning, but we ask for your understanding and patience. We also want you to know that if there should be an uptick in the number of COVID-19 cases in our area, if not sooner, uh, the, that's being predicted, then we will go back to online service only, just as we've done the past several weeks. In closing, I would like to say it would be great to see many of you once again after we've been apart for so many months. I know the conditions presented here do not sound all that appealing, and they may, but we think that they are deemed necessary. If, after a period of time, things should get better in our area, then we may relax some of these procedures. But until that time, we will have to carry on with what's been presented. Once again, you do not have to feel like you're obligated to be here, and no one's going to judge you whether you attend or not. Everyone, please be safe, and be sure to tune in for upcoming videos and emails that I've mentioned and you will see these probably within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I have presented a lot of information. I've gone quickly to save time, but if you uh, need more information and you feel like you've missed something, you're always welcome to review this service at any time. And if, there, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact the office or email the, call or email the church office for any questions. Thank you for your attention, and now I'd like to lead us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are who you are, Father. We know that you love us and you take care of us and, and, and that you're always looking out for our well-being. Father, we just pray during this time of uncertainty and, and, and the crisis that's going on in our world, Father, we just pray that you would give us as elders, deacons, ministers, members, you give us the wisdom that we need to do the things that we need to do, Father. We just pray that you would give everyone here at Greenwood Park a spirit of, of patience and cooperation as we try to go by these procedures, Father, and returning to service. We know it would be hard for many people. And Father, we're only doing it because we love people and we want all people to be taken care of. Father, we also ask that you be with Ruth and the family, and as well as Amanda and Evan Brown and, and the passing of their loved ones, Father. We just thank you that you're with them. We just pray that you would help them to feel our love and our concern and sympathy for them during this most difficult time, that you would give them peace. Father, we just ask that you continue to be with us and, and help us to have wisdom on all decisions that we make. Father, we love you and we thank you through your son Jesus. Amen. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host
Good morning, church family. My name is Ray Newton. I'm one of the shepherds here at Greenwood Park Church of Christ. In these troubled times, the eldership has lately come to realize that our internal belief that we treat all people fairly and the same is insufficient. Acting justly, yet being silent, because we behave the same with people of any color is not enough. As children, we sing, red or yellow, black or white, they are precious in his sight. But we don't act to show that to society. We'll stand on the street rightfully protesting abortion, but we won't stand on the same street protesting abuse because of a person's skin color. That's not right. We owe everyone alive the same respect we show to those not yet born. The following statement from the elders is not a political statement, nor is it to be scrutinized for any hidden meanings. We are not supporting radical movements on either end of the political spectrum. Knowing that Black Lives Matter is a fundamental belief we share with all children of God. He made mankind all these colors for a reason, and it was not for murder or oppression, segregation or degradation. He made skin color differences that he found perfect because his creation is perfect. We read in Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The Elder Statement. As committed followers of Jesus Christ, the leadership of Greenwood Park Church of Christ condemns systematic and individual racism in all its forms. We recognize that we minister in a world that includes racism, injustice, hatred, and violence. Our mission statement is elevate God, embrace a shared life, engage the broken world. We strongly condemn the violence witnessed across our country against people of color whose lives matter to us. We acknowledge that our country has not always treated people of color as though their lives matter to us as much as we believe our lives matter to God. This statement is far too late and only the first step in our commitment to learning how to love, advocate for, and better partner with people of color. I'd like to read a passage from God's Word in Acts 17, verses 24 to 29. The God who made the world and everything in it, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives life and breath, and everything to everyone. From one man, he created every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth, determining their set times and the fixed limits of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God, perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. So since we are God's offspring, we should not think the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human skill and imagination. Would you pray with me? Dear God, 
we come to you asking for forgiveness, grace, and mercy. We confess any complicity in racism and hatred we have ingrained within us due to our sin and fleshly desires. Lord, we repent. We turn back to you with a desire to see people as you see them, as fellow image bearers of you, loved and respected. God, grant us wisdom and let your name be the only one glorified. We ask all this humbly and for your glory through Jesus. Amen. This is holy So good morning again. This morning we're going to have communion earlier in the service because it's appropriate as we think about how we live with each other, how we treat each other, that we also reflect on how we all live in Christ. And it feels right to communicate with him to remember Christ who died for all people to come together around the table and think about his love for all creation, regardless of, as we say, color, creed, or national origin. You just heard a great hymn on holy ground. 
I hope you've thought about the words. Reflect on them. Find them online and review them, because we are. We're here together around the table. We may be physically separated, but we're together. We may be remote, but we are united by a common love. We may be alone, but we're connected through Christ's death, a death for all of mankind. This communion is not about bread and wine. It's about the body and blood of Christ. It's not a ritual, but a person to worship. Jesus is less concerned about the method of celebrating communion and more concerned about how we celebrate it. And this is not an obligation. This is a celebration. It's about praising God, listening to Jesus, and doing what he says. Communion celebrates the gospel. Jesus was broken for us so that we can be fixed by him. He was broken for everybody, regardless of color, regardless of background. In the gospel it says, as you do this for the least of these, you do this for me. Do unto others as you would have it done to you. Jesus says, leave the 99 and find the one that's lost the one that's suffering, the one that's persecuted. Maybe he meant people of all colors as well. Communion celebration marks the story of Jesus, how he gave completely to give every person a better life, a new start, a fresh relationship with God, a fresh relationship each of us with each other. I am so thankful that Greenwood Park is a diverse family, and hopefully we will continue to be more and more diverse as time goes by. Our diversity is our strength, a strength as we walk together in the mystery of his kingdom. So at this point, I will give a prayer for the communion and ask you to celebrate Christ, and listen to the words of the song that follows. Dear Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for your will that, that you would sacrifice him for each of us, that you would show us the way to live in him every week, to remember him, and not just him broken, but him as an example, he that walked and celebrated with those that society walked away from, he that touched the leper, he that healed the sick, he that, that celebrated with people that society just couldn't stand. Dear Father, the example for us is manifest and as we take this this morning, we ask you to help us get our lives like his. That as we celebrate his death, we celebrate the life and everybody's life around us. We ask all this in Christ. Amen. Oh
And welcome to week 16, day 106 of Sermon on the Net. No, I'm not going to redeem those numbers. There's way too many of them. Besides, it looks like, based on the announcement this morning, that we got light at the end of the tunnel. And that in a couple weeks, Lord willing, we're going to be meeting together in this room live, those of you that are able to do that. Of course, be reminded that we still will have the online worship. It will just be live now. I would assume that what we were going to do is the 11 o'clock worship will probably be the one that's recorded. And so um, it may change from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock for those of you that are going to uh, decide to stay home. 
Let's, uh, I just want to say this about this, this time that we're in. A lot of the planning, a lot of the things that we talk about, it doesn't believe, it matter whether it's believers or unbelievers. Most of the people that I talk to, all we do is we talk about this virus and talk about the news reports and talk about what's going on. I just want to encourage everybody that we have a big God who still is a miracle worker. Let's not leave him out of this. Keep praying for God to intervene and do something that only God can do during this time. Let me just encourage you to, to agree with me and join me in that, that praying, that prayer. Tonight is a scheduled summer on the lawn where we have an opportunity actually tonight to see one another uh, for a time of praise and prayer outside. The plan was um, for me to actually tell you, I know I burst the bubble last week, that this is not live, this is actually Saturday uh, so that makes it a little difficult, but um, the uh, plan was for me to tell you right now whether or not the rain is going to keep us from having that meeting or whether or not we're going to be able to meet. But because the forecast changes like the wind, uh, and it was 100% at one time, uh, it was now in the forecast at 15%, now I find out it's back up to 50%. So sometime on Sunday, which will be today that you're watching this, Around noon, we will let you know whether or not we're going to do this or not. Because if it does rain, we will not have this. Um, because it's going to be outside. If we do it, bring your lawn chairs. Uh, we'll have squares painted for you, and we'll be uh, physically distanced for that. We will not have Godfidence this Wednesday night. Uh, it's always our tradition with summer series not to have a speaker uh, during the week of July the 4th. And our, that's closest to July 4th, the Wednesday is closest to July 4th, and so we're doing that. Uh, we will not have it this week, but it will return Wednesday night, July the 8th. And again, I want to encourage you to continue with your Project 51 stories. So much good stuff in here. So many things I want to preach. In fact, what I'm going to talk about today, I started out with one idea and I ended up with another one. Um, and so I didn't even, uh, didn't even do what I'd planned because there's just so much rich information in there, so many stories, good things for families to read together, just so much in there. But I have preached a lot of things that are in these scriptures already here at Greenwood Park. But what I want to do today, um, you know, last week we finished looking at the second greatest prophet in the history of Israel, um, Elijah. Now, I know what you're thinking. If Elijah's the second greatest prophet, then who in the world's number one? And I know that you're probably thinking, well, could it be Samuel? Could it be Isaiah, Jeremiah? I'm going to go ahead and say no. Uh, his name is Elisha. You just take the J out of Elijah, replace it with the sh, S-H, sh, as in be still, sh, be still and know that I'm God. Because this man showed people who God was. He displayed the power of God. Uh, he's the most powerful prophet ever, perhaps for some of you, the greatest prophet that you've never heard of. But uh, you see, while Isaiah and Jeremiah were busy writing books of prophecy, Elijah and Elisha were busy displaying the power of God, or God was displaying his power through them. And actually, these were not contemporaries. They existed a few years apart. Obviously, Elijah and Elisha had a little bit of time together, as we're going to talk about today. But in the moment that I want to share briefly today what the secret to Elisha's power was. But I want to go ahead and tell you this, that in talking about Elisha, because there's so much to say, that this is going to be two, maybe three weeks that I'll be looking at the life of this great prophet. But before I get into Elisha, I want to talk about the end of Elijah's life. I've got to specify the difference in the two. I feel like with the times that we're in and all the things that are happening in our world, that there are a lot of parallels with the end of Elijah's life that we need to learn from before, uh, we need to learn from, excuse me, before we get into the life of Elisha. Like, like us, Elijah experienced highs and lows, um, ups and downs. And it's easy to think because of the great miracles that Elijah worked that he's bigger than life, but as we learned last week, James says about Elijah that he was a human being, even as we are. I mean, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, it didn't rain, and on the, land, on the land for three and a half years. Elijah had to learn from God. He had to learn how to depend on God daily. He also learned that God can take care of you 
any time, that he can meet you anywhere, that he can provide for any need, and nothing is impossible to him, and it's never too late for him to do anything. And that's what Elijah learned uh, in an interesting way. God taught him this by sending him, and this drought took place, he sent him to a brook, a brook that probably was going to dry up because of the drought. And in that, at that brook, he taught Elijah to, to depend on a raven, an unclean animal, to be fed. Well, then after that, he sends him to a poor widow to be fed and provided for, to have food and shelter. A poor widow who had one son, a poor widow who had just a teaspoon or whatever left of flour and oil and was planned on cooking one last meal for her and her son, and then they were going to die. Well, then God worked a miracle through him where she, her flour and her oil did not run out, and so he lived in the upstairs of her house. Well, then, unexpectedly, her son dies. And Elijah cries out to God. And Elijah prays, and the son is resurrected. So all of these examples in his life where God provided and God showed him, you can depend on me for, for miracles. You can depend on me for absolutely anything. And then he faces, there's a false worship that's going on among the, uh, many of the people of Israel because Jezebel has led them into worshiping Baal and worshiping Asherah. And so Elijah decides to, to have a showdown at Mount Carmel. And in that showdown, he faces 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And there at that showdown, he starts it out, and all the people of Israel there, he starts it out by saying, how long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. And that word limping, we learned last week, is a word that's used of a bird that can't decide which bow to land on. It just goes from one place to the other. It's just going all over the place. And that's the way Israel was, and it's a lot like the times that we live in. I mean, the same question could be asked today. How long are we going to limp between man's wisdom and God's wisdom? How long are we going to go between? If God is God, serve him. Follow him. Follow his lead. So, here he is in this situation, and he faces these prophets, and they build altars, and he gives them the advantage. I mean, after all, Baal supposedly is the god of the weather. Baal supposedly is the god that brings fire from heaven, and so that's the test. I'm going to build these altars, and you call on your gods, and whichever god brings fire from heaven, that's the true god. And so the Baals start crying out. The, 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 the prophets of Baal and Asherah start crying out. I love it. Elijah, he, he, he starts to taunt them. Maybe your gods have gone to sleep. Maybe they've gone to the restroom. Maybe they're on vacation. And as he taunts them and he sees, he witnesses with his own eyes that God is taken care of, then he digs a trench around his altar and they put water in it, fill it up three times so it's drenched with water, and he cries out to God, God, show yourself as the one God. Reveal yourself as God. And fire comes down from heaven, devours up all the water and the sacrifice. And you know, he had this incredible, incredible experience. As he asked God that he show people who he was, that people may know that you're God. Let me ask you this. In your prayers right now, is that your main request? That God, you do something will show you as God to this world, to our nation. Do something that only you can do. Do something that no one else, nothing else can get the credit for but you. Well, the people see this and they proclaim in one voice, the Lord is God, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And they take the 850 prophets down the mountain and Elijah slaughters them there. And then comes the rain. Been a drought. By now, Elijah's so pumped and so full of spirit, so passionate that this old Gandalf looking man starts running ahead of the chariot uh, full of the horses, horse drawn chariots that are running with Ahab, the king, on it. And he's so excited. Things are so powerful. And so I want to just give you a couple of clicks, uh, a couple of picks here that we're going to keep on the screen for a minute or two. A couple of picks that in 2022, Lord willing, we're going to go to Israel. If you go to Israel, we will go to Mount Carmel, which is where all this happened. The one on the left is 
the actual top of the mountain, the area where the children of Israel would have been, the 850 prophets and where the altar was built and where the showdown would have taken place. On the right, you, have, you see how high this mountain is. You see the valley of Jezreel. And down there, you see where in the middle where there's this crooked, this winding little green that looks like it's maybe, that's where the brook was where Elijah slaughtered the prophets. And then there's this little, beside, to the left of that, there's this little, this little, uh, little hill that's called a tell. That's the city of Jezreel. That's the city where uh, Jezebel was from. It's the city where, you're going to read it this week, where Jezebel falls out of the tower, and as God prophesied, or was prophesied, dogs are going to devour her. Now, in days when I wasn't real smart, I actually preached a sermon. It was during the days when the song, Who Let the Dogs Out, was popular. I actually preached a sermon about that called, Who Let the Dogs Out. It probably wasn't one of my wisest decisions ever, but that doesn't matter. This is also the valley where Elijah outran the chariot. All this to say, God has worked mightily in Elijah's life. And man, he's so passionate, he's so full of the Spirit, you can sleep for days on the joy and peace that he had to have as a result of God working so mighty. But let's look at, at uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 19 for a second and see what happened. Here, while he's riding this wave, while he's resting on the victory, it says Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as a life of one of them this, this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. It's like nothing ever happened. <laughs> it's like none of those things I just shared happened in his life. He's afraid. He runs for his life. He ran for an entire day. Look, let me ask you something. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever been there? Have you ever had moments of great victory in your life that you thought you could live on forever? Or at least you thought you could at least rest for a week or two. But then something happened, it's like it never happened. Unexpected news comes out of nowhere. It may be a trial that's not as great as what you've experienced in times past, but because of the timing, it just knocks you off the tracks. In fact, many, many times, a great, great day is followed by a terrible day. Why is that? Is that because God's mean? Is that because God's unfaithful? Now, I want you to listen to me right now. And I want you to look at me. I said all this Wednesday, but it bears repeating for those who have already heard it and those that didn't hear it, you need to hear it. Because we live in a fallen world and because the devil never stops, never, ever, 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 did I say ever stops? That's why things like that happen. And that's why we've got to learn the lesson that, that God taught Elijah. That's daily, daily dependence on God. I mean, we often take a break after victory. After thousands of years of practice, Satan knows that's the time to have all his forces ready. That's the time. I mean, right there, he's let his guard down. Fire! She's lost her cover. Attack! You know, right now, you can go back in your life, and you know it's true. How many times have you decided just to take a breath, take a chill pill, take a break? You see, that's what's happening in the unseen world when things hit you out of nowhere. But here's the thing. Satan's relentless, but our God is relentless too. You see, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's why Jesus said, in this world you have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. That's why Jesus says, remain in me, which is present tense. Live in me, dwell in me, have a relationship with me. That's why Paul said, Paul said, who can separate you from the love of Christ? What can separate you? Can tribulation, can distress, can nakedness, or peril, or famine, or danger, or sword? 
No, in all these things you're more than conquerors through him that loved us. That neither angels, nor demons, nor height, nor depth, nor life, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus your Lord. Because our God is just as relentless. But the truth is, if we don't depend on him daily and we don't dwell in that, the threat of one woman after defeating 850 prophets of Baal is going to be seen out of perspective, just like it was with Elijah. In fairness to Elijah, he probably thought that what we would think in those times, I mean, he probably thought that the miracle at Carmel would have been the means of affecting the conversion of the whole court and all of the country. I mean, I think he probably had. I, I see Ahab when he came home and says, man, you wouldn't believe what Elijah did. But Jezebel didn't take it that way. You see, Ahab, I think, was on the threshold of being a good king. But the problem that Ahab has is the same problem that Solomon had. Ahab didn't marry well. You guys that hadn't gotten married yet, consider that. Marry well. I'm sure Elijah thought that the dramatic display of power at Mount Carmel and the fact that the people fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. You know what he thought. Revival has hit the land. And then the famine's broken. Oh, I fulfilled my purpose. But Satan never stops as long as we're breathing on this earth. And so we've got to daily pursue God and never stop. That's why Jesus, God's will for us in Christ Jesus is rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, never stop. We've got to be relentless like the devil's relentless. Relentless in praising God and worshiping God. We have a constant need for him. You see, this war, this battle is real in this fallen world. So when you watch the news... You need to be aware that there is news behind the news, and that's the real news. That Ephesians 6 news, that our battle's not against flesh and blood. Now, what do we do in these downtown, down times? I want to give you some encouragement from Elijah the man that I want to share before we leave him. When we're discouraged about the ups and downs in life, and sometimes we get discouraged because we're discouraged. And sometimes sermons like this, where I'm talking about remaining in Christ, get you discouraged. Because it's like, well, Kenneth, I'm sorry. I'm just depressed. But don't let Satan, first of all, tell you that you are a failure. Because if you look at your attachments, you'll see that, you, that I am accepted. I am secure. I am significant. I am saved. I am delivered. I am free. I am chosen. I am loved. I am free from condemnation. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I am enabled. I am empowered. I am established. I am sealed. You see, that's who you are. But it's okay to realize that even Elijah, a man like you and me, but a man so close to God that he left this earth, he didn't die. He left in a chariots and horses of fire to heaven. But even Elijah had the same fear that you and I have. Did you hear that? Even Elijah had the same fear that you and I have. Even Elijah had the same nature to give up and quit uh, that we have. Even Elijah allowed worry and fear and anxiety to take over. Even Elijah felt desperate and alone. Even Elijah felt depressed and helpless. But the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper God found him. You see, even when we don't see him, he's working. Even when we don't feel him, he's working. Because God can take care of us every time. He can meet us everywhere. He can provide for our every need. And nothing is impossible for him. He can provide everything that we need. Now, I'm not going to read this passage, uh, but um, it's the passage where God finds Elijah. And God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah says, I've been very jealous for you, but I'm the only one left. I mean, he's just experienced what he did, but he still thinks, I'm the only one left. And so, there comes a, an earthquake, there comes a wind, there comes fire that says that God wasn't found in any of those. And finally, there was this still, small voice, and that's where God was found. You see, God is here. He's present in our earthquakes. He's present 
in, our, in the wind. He's present in all of these situations, but he doesn't get in a shouting match with him. It's the person that remains in him. It's the person that has ears to hear, that listens, that hears the still, small voice in the midst of the turmoil. You see, for Elijah, it was Jezebel that made it difficult for him to hear, but he did. You see, God is completely set apart. He's not going to compete with our creation. That's why he seeks this relationship with us, that we would remain in him. So I want you to notice this too. Here's what Elijah, God says to Elijah, I will find 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He's saying, you're not alone. There's 7,000. 7,000, and one's about to join him. His name's Elisha. And so we need to be encouraged too sometimes when we see and we're thinking, what is happening to our world? What is happening all around us? And we get discouraged as believers. I'm going to tell you something. I believe there's 7,000 that haven't bowed to Baal in Kentucky alone. There's a lot of people crying out to God. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to do what God calls for us to do. He says, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. As I've done for several weeks now, I want to ask you to join us and set in your alarm at 714 and pray in that prayer. So what wicked ways do we need to turn from? Well, we saw some of it this morning already. Maybe the wicked ways of apathy and indifference and intolerance toward others and tolerance of sin, <laughs> injustice, judgment, condemnation, idolatry. We have plenty of idolatry, things that have taken the place of God in our lives, adultery and all the sexual sins, pride, hypocrisy, privilege, entitlement, religion, a form of godliness but denying its power, of course, racism and prejudice and hopelessness and prayerlessness and unbelief and materialism and greed and the list could go on and on and on that we ask God to forgive us of our sins and heal our land. So I want to ask you to join us every day because the scriptures tell us that God's word will not return to him void but it will accomplish what it sets out to accomplish. If that's what God says in his word and that's how God says he's going to heal the land that's what we as believers need to be doing. So Elisha comes along, and he's following Elijah around to the day that he's taken up to heaven. And so this one day, Elijah says, says to Elisha, he says, Stay here, because God has sent me to Bethel. <laughs> and I love the response of Elisha, shows his heart. He says, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Some of the other prophets that were around are saying, you know today that your the Lord is your Lord is going to take the Lord is going to take your master away. And I love Elisha so much, he just says, I mean, Elisha says, I know, keep quiet. Now, he's not that nice because we have children watching, and I know parents don't allow their children to say this. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm just not going to say it. But you probably can figure it out. Next, Elijah says, stay here. The Lord is sending me to Jericho. He says the same thing again. He says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And then the prophets come up to him again and say, say well, well, well uh, you know that the Lord's going to take your master away. And he says, I know. <clears throat> okay. Next, Elijah says, stay here. The Lord He's sending me to Jordan. The whole thing goes on again. This time, after crossing the Jordan, Elijah, well, let's just read what he says. It's in 2 Kings 2, 9 through 12. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You've asked a hard thing, yet... If you see me as I'm being taken from you, 
it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Please, he said, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. I mean, basically, he was requesting, he was requesting the spiritual rights of a firstborn son. Now, I know that I've, I've said it many times, but I believe it, like many things that I say, bears repeating. I've often said, we're not in a marathon. We are in a relay. And our job is to run in full sprint until we leave this earth and pass the baton to the next generation. What we have here is the perfect illustration of that idea. The times that we are in in this nation with racism and the idolatry that's, that's grinded to a halt during this quarantine are a great time for us to give the next generation a double portion to get this right Finally, to put God on the throne where God is meant to be. To live in the way that the kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven through us. This is our time. And the question is, where is our faith? You see, Elijah had great faith. And like our Savior Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. How's your faith today? Do you have audacious faith? The kind of faith that's willing to ask God for a double portion of his spirit? Notice what Elijah says. He says, keep your eyes on me when I go. Now that's all you got to do. Just, if you keep your eyes on me when I go, then you'll have what you ask. Sounds easy, doesn't it? It would be easy except for this Chariots and horses of fire stuff. I mean, that'd be very hard to keep your eyes on Elijah when there's chariots and horses. I mean, who sees that? You don't see that every day. It's kind of like Peter. If he'd have kept his eyes on Jesus, he wouldn't have sunk. But there was those winds in that wave, you know, the waves that caused the problem. And, and for us, it could be this pandemic and the laborious news that got every opinion in the world that's going on. Where's the truth? Where's the truth? And of course, looking at all the struggles that we have in our nation, it could be the racism that keeps plaguing us and the appearance that this is never, we're never going to get this right. And so it's easy for us not to keep our eyes on Jesus. And so this morning, there, there are two important things that I want us to note. First, there are a couple of questions. Are you seeking a double portion by trying to get the absolute most out of your one life. You see, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, now, I want to go ahead and say this, I've got that in all caps, and the reason I have that in all caps is because many people say this only is spoken to the apostles. Well, the word whoever, he didn't say you, he said whoever, you know whoever is? It's whoever. That's you. That's me. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Whoa. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Then he says, whatever, not whatever, it's just whatever. You ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name... I will do it. And then later on in chapter 16, he says, it is good for me to go because if I do not go, then the helper will not come. The helper, the Holy Spirit, is how it's possible for those who come after Jesus to do greater things than he did. Like take the gospel to the world. Because each one of us is filled with the Spirit of God. You see, Jesus never left Galilee. He never left Galilee but with the Spirit indwelling believers, believers went all over the world back then. And today, today, you add the Internet and all the stuff that we have, 
we can do things even greater than what the first century apostles did because we are still indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. A lot of us have not because we ask not or honestly, we have it and we don't know it because we have been victims of bad preaching throughout the years. Jesus said over and over again in scriptures, ask anything. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you think, well, that was in the Gospels. Okay, let's go outside of the Gospels so you'll know it pertains to you. He says, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that the, he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what he asks of us. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. So I say to you, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So my second question, the second thing, is are you living a life worthy of a double portion? Are you living a life, let's put it this way, worthy of? Of pursuing. Are you living a life in such a way, your life in such a way that children look at you and say, I want that? Are you living in such a way that younger Christians take note of you? So, this past week was a difficult week for us at Greenwood Park. Our dear brother in Christ, Larson Hudson, uh, passed away. And what I have here is some photos from my daughter's wedding. Uh, yes, Larson and Ruth really know how to dance. I don't know where they did that. They obviously were not practicing their Church of Christness in learning how to dance so well. But they won the competition, being married for 50 plus years, and then out dancing everybody there. But if you notice in the photo, I'm going to keep it up here long enough for you to see it. The one on the right. To the right of Larson, you see my wife. Um, to the left, in between their hands, you see the bride, my daughter, and the groom, and they're smiling. And I watched them during this time. Everyone was looking on, I just I don't know any other way to put it, in awe. Me, I'm over to the right of the pillar there sitting down because they were wearing me out the way they were dancing. But we all looked on in awe. So much so that my daughter and my son-in-law looked on as this incredible model at their wedding reception. This incredible model that they were to say, that, that's why we're getting married. That's what we want to look like. And, And my wife and I are looking on and say, if God gives us the grace to be married for 50 plus years, that's what we want it to look like. You see, that's what we're called to be, to live a life worth pursuing and if you're filled with the Holy Spirit you're filled with the character of God which I talk about every week it's love and joy and peace and patience and you know the list which are the things that the whole world is looking for that when they're lived out through us we do greater things than you'll ever imagine when they're lived out through us people look on and say that (laughs) that's what I'm looking for And because we as believers have not done a good job at living that way, people are looking for it in sex, they're looking for it in money, they're looking at it in pleasure, they're looking for it on the internet, they're looking for it in the games they play, they're looking for it everywhere. But it's not found in anything. It's found in God. And he has, for whatever reason, filled us up so that we can display it in our lives like sweet Larson and Ruth do so well. You see, that's what gives us hope. You look on and you see something like you say, that, that, that gives me hope. That gives me confidence. That gives me something to look forward to, something to shoot for, something to pursue. And the realization that, there's, that we all need to know that there's always someone watching all of us. For Elijah, it was Elisha who took his baton and did so much more than Elijah ever did. And that's what gives our life purpose. That is our purpose. That is our mission in life. 
Now, some of you may be young, and you may think, well, I don't want to wait 50 years to make that kind of impact. That's okay, because if you live a life worthy of pursuing at whatever age, a life that makes others want to have a double portion, it is noticed because it's so, so uncommon. I want to share a story thinking about that from Earl McManus from his book, Seizing Your Divine Moment. It relates uh, to what I'm talking about right now. It relates to the situation our country's in. It relates to, to, to the decision, the statement that was read by our shepherds today related to, to one of the great ills that we're facing in our nation. I want you to think about this story. It's Erwin McManus in his book, Seizing Your Divine Moment. He says, it was a combination family vacation and a speaking engagement. The location was the beautiful beaches of Florida's northern peninsula. My wife Kim and our kids Aaron and Mariah were looking forward to enjoying the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. My assignment was to call several thousand singles to a life of sacrifice as we bask in soothing tranquility. <laughs> a tropical storm had just hit the area and left the waters basically unswimmable, but my little boy Aaron insisted on going down to the beach. So we walked from our beachside hotel down four or five steps right onto the beach. And to my right, there were perhaps a hundred or so singles enjoying the Florida sun. And then I saw him. He had somehow managed to find his way to the water, and now he had begun to find his way back. I had not seen him before, and he did not appear to be a part of the retreat. In fact, it seemed as if no one was even aware of him. He appeared alone in the middle of the crowd. He was a double amputee who had worked his way with the use of specialized crutches through the sandy beach. And just as I had noticed him, one crutch slipped and he fell hard to the sand. Undaunted, he pulled himself back up and began again, only to fall a second time. It all happened in what seemed an instant, long enough for me to see him to my right and choose to turn to my left. I wish I could say I simply wasn't thinking, but the problem was that I was. I knew if I turned to my right, I would have to do something. So I turned to my left. I, I gently placed my arm on my son's shoulder, turned him away, and began talking to him to distract him from the scene below. We went a few feet, and I felt sure we were free from any responsibility until my son stopped me. To my surprise, he said, I've got to go help that man. No explanation was needed. I knew exactly what he meant. His words pierced through me, and I stood there paralyzed in my hypocrisy. I could only look at him and say, then go help. Several thoughts were racing through my mind. I had been caught was one of them. Yet at that point, it wasn't that I was unwilling to go. It was just clear that this was Aaron's moment. I had missed mine. His compassion had moved him to heroism. And while Aaron seized his divine moment, I was stuck in a moment I couldn't get out of. I watched my 10-year-old son run across the beach and without explanation begin to pick the man up. I had to wonder what the man was thinking when this little boy grabbed him in his crutch and tried to pull him up. I watched as the crowd turned and saw Aaron's futile effort to help the man back to the hotel deck. Almost immediately, I watched the crowd move toward Aaron and the man. Someone picked up the crutches while others reached down and picked up the man. The group moved as if they were one unit committed to helping the man complete his journey. And after the group helped him return to the hotel deck, Aaron came running back to me with tears in his eyes. He looked at me with his, innocent, with his innocent conclusion. I couldn't help him. I wasn't strong enough. And he couldn't see that no one would have helped the man at all if he hadn't taken the initiative. My sense of shame was overwhelmed by my deep sense of pride in, my, in who my son was becoming. I explained to Aaron that his strength is what carried the man. It was because of him that others came to his aid. Doesn't matter how old you are. All of us are empowered by God's Holy Spirit to do even greater things than Jesus himself did. Based on the words of Jesus. Just as Elisha. Elisha's about to do some things that Elijah could not have even dreamed of. I'm going to ask you, well, first of all, 
If you're not a believer, you can go to the connection card and there's a place where you can say, I want to know what I need to do to become a Christian and we'll get in touch with you. We'll talk to you about putting your faith in Christ and about baptism. When you're baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who indwells you and fills you with the character, purpose, and the mission of God. But I'm going to ask all of us, let's all of us be intentional this week. Seek to get the most, absolute most out of your one life this week. Decide to live a life worthy of pursuing. Decide to live a life full of the Spirit that allows the fruit of the Spirit to be displayed in you. A life that gives hope, a life that gives purpose, a life that displays the character of God through the Holy Spirit that's in you. A life that can only happen if we're remaining in Him, if we're doing His will. Let me encourage you to do this, maybe even this specifically. Take some time to write a note, an email, a Facebook message, whatever, to a person that you're watching, that you're watching, that's living a life that you want to pursue. A person or a couple that gives you hope, let them know that you've seen them, you've caught them displaying a double portion. And then ask God to reveal opportunities for you to seize your divine opportunity and do it. Let me just encourage you to look to God, not the news and not man's wisdom. Fix your eyes on Jesus this week. Those who go to God for safety will be protected by the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, you are my place of safety and protection. You are my God and I trust you. God will save you from hidden traps and deadly diseases. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you can hide. His truth will be your shield and protection. You'll not fear any dangers by night or an arrow during the day. You'll not be afraid of diseases that come in the dark or sickness that strikes at noon. At your side, a thousand people may die or 10,000 right beside you, but you'll not be hurt. The Lord is your, your protection. You've made God most high your place of safety. Nothing bad will happen to you. No disaster will come to your home. He's put his angels in charge for you to watch over you wherever you go. They'll catch you in your hand so they'll not hit a foot on the rock. The Lord says, those who love me, I'll save. I'll protect those who know me. And they'll call on me and I'll answer them. I'll be with them in trouble. I'll rescue them and I'll honor them. I'll give them a long, full life and they'll see how I can save. And now our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance on you and give you his peace. And may the peace of God that transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May you strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. You are my strength when I am weak. You are